Well, I don't know about you, but I'm quite happy just to let this part go. We've had such a wonderful evening. I feel like the person who said, you know, would you like me to speak or do you want to go on enjoying yourselves? Um, it's very humbling to hear from our brother from Pakistan and then to be led in praise. Uh, but, you know, we need to remind ourselves of something, and that is that what God has said to us is actually of greater significance than anything that we can ever say to him. And that's why he has given us his word. And that's why it's uh, wonderfully encouraging, at least for me today, and my wife too, uh, to realize that the continual point of reference is back to the scriptures, back to Christ, back to the gospel. And so, um, in light of that, I want us to pay attention to verses 8 to 16, and I'm going to read them so that they are fresh in our minds. I think the scriptures will appear in some miraculous way. Yeah. Accordingly, Paul writes, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he indeed is useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Lord, as we turn to the Bible after what has been a long and very a wonderful day. Uh, we pray that you will open our eyes so that we might behold wonderful things out of your law. Uh, make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself within your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior and make the book live to me for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, this is not the story of three men trying to be better. Um, anybody who wanted to get that from the Bible is simply using the Bible as a trampoline to jump up and down on, but not actually doing any exposition. It is an amazing story, as we said this morning, of the transforming power of God in the lives of a once proud Pharisee, a prosperous homeowner, and a runaway slave, all of them now united by personal faith in Jesus. So in short order, it is a story both of transformation and of reconciliation. And I wonder, are you struck by the tone with which Paul goes at things here? Let me just point it out to you, if I may. First of all, uh, he points out to uh, Philemon that he is not there with a demand, but rather with a request. I prefer to appeal to you. I could actually use my authority. It's on the basis of love, for love's sake I do this. It is heartfelt, he says, this in verse 12. I'm sending my very heart back to you. It's selfless in verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me because he could have helped me, but I preferred not to do that so that you might be the beneficiary of it. And through it all, he recognizes too uh, the providence of God in the circumstances that have led to these things. It is, in short order, a word to all of us who are involved in any form of leadership. Here is somebody who is uniquely gifted, somebody who is profoundly, amazingly powerful. He's written a third of the New Testament, for goodness sake. And yet, he doesn't come high-handed to the task at hand. Spurgeon, uh, the Victorian preacher, uh, used to tell his students that more flies are caught in a jar of honey than in a pot of vinegar. And many of us as leaders could do well to remind ourselves of that. Uh, I wish that I had learned it a lot younger than I am today. Uh, there is a great temptation when you're young 
uh, to think that somehow that you can drive people from behind. And it takes time to realize that that's not helpful at all. It, you have to lead them gently from the front. It's a happy day, actually, when you learn that lesson. I hope I'm learning it, uh, that uh, our influence is one um, of friendliness rather than forcefulness, but it, is, it's, it dies hard depending on your personality. And um, I have been known to be relatively forceful from time to time, and uh, sometimes when I'm driving in the car, uh, I manage to point out everybody else's uh, incapacity with uh, their ability uh, behind a wheel. And year, years ago, I was uh, in, in one of my uh, exposés as I drove down the road saying, oh, you know, why don't you move over? Why do you get out of the way? Why, why don't you know when to go? When, why would you wait so long? And so on. And after I had exhausted myself for a period of maybe a minute and a half, it was just total silence in the car. And then a small voice from the back seat, my son said, and that's another kind word from your pastor. <laughs> so, so out of the mouths of babes, right? And uh, yes, I remind myself of it frequently. No, the tone is very important, isn't it? It's a tone of entreaty rather than that of demand or command. In giving up the latter, that is demand or command, and condescending to the former, that is to entreaty, then he has greater power, as we're going to see, to deliver what he desires. There's nothing mechanical about this. It's, it's, a, it's a genius letter in many ways, as we're going to see, at least by tomorrow morning. There's nothing manipulative in it either. He appeals to uh, Philemon on the basis that he can because he's already introduced Philemon as agapetos, that this is a loving soul, this fellow, Philemon. So I appeal to you on the basis of love. Also, he says, I have to acknowledge the fact that I appeal to you as an old man. How old he was, we don't know, uh, but he was as old as he felt. And he was also appealing uh, on the basis of the fact that he was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus. So, lesson learned, he was truthful and he was tactful. But it's only when you get to verse 10 that he now makes his appeal. It's very, very good to recognize this, isn't it? We said this morning there are 335 words and he's 145 words into it before he even gets to his point. No wonder he was a good preacher, huh? And... Uh, if you, if you imagine this being read, and you imagine Philemon listening to this, and he's following along and following along, and he still doesn't know what he's on about, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus. Oh, man. Onesimus. Think of everything that runs through Philemon's head about Onesimus. That rascal. That runaway. That fellow. I appeal to you for Onesimus. I have become a father, though I've been under lock and key, he says. And the child's name is Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. How did he become a father to him? Well, you need to read elsewhere where Paul talks in those terms. We don't have time to go into it right now. But he recognizes the fact uh, that what he has done in bringing to bear the gospel upon this character has brought him to spiritual life in Jesus and the great mystery that is in it. Uh, when he writes in the Corinthian letter, you remember he says, you know, what after all is Paul? What after all is Apollos, Cephas, only servants through whom you came to believe? One plants, another waters, but only God can make things grow. And he's aware of that. But he's also aware of the immense privilege that has been given to him of seeing this fellow come to living faith in Jesus. It's quite wonderful, isn't it? The hymn writer gets it perfectly. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, and creating faith in him. It is mysterious. When you preach, if you preach, you realize the people are before you, they hear your voice. The fact that they hear your voice does not mean that they hear the voice of God. It is only the voice of God that is heard that brings about that change. 
How is the voice of God to be heard? It is mysterious. I know not how the Spirit moves. Two people sitting side by side, listening to the exact same address. One person walks out and says, my life has been turned upside down. And the other person who was, went to the event with him says, I frankly had no clue what that guy was talking about. How does this happen? If it was simply logic, if it was simply the ability of rhetoric, if it was simply the compelling influence of a personality, then we would be able to explain it. But we can't. But Paul understands it. What an amazing thing. This fellow, this fellow, I'm sending him back to you. He was once absolutely useless to you. I know that. But it's not the old Onesimus that I'm sending back to you. Not the one that stole your money and ran away. I'm sending him back. He's going to be entirely different. You know, it's a reminder in passing as well that in the mystery of God's purposes, he uses the brokenness and the messed upness of the bits and pieces of our lives, of other people's lives, to show us that all our deeds and all our days may prove under his sovereign power and plan to be good for someone, to be useful to someone. Read Christian biography and you see it. John Newton as just a, a ridiculous character in the Navy, a complete mess, was really absolutely useless. Until in that great storm, what did he remember? He remembered the voice of his mother as a five-year-old boy, and he cried out to God, and he was saved. Gladys Aylward, so tiny with straight black hair, working as a servant in a garret, sleeping in a garret in, in London, feeling the call of God on her life, and bemoaning the fact that she was so small, she didn't have nice hair like other people had, and yet she believed that she could be useful to God. She was turned down by the missionary organization. They said, you're too small, you're too dim, you just know nothing at all. But she went, didn't she? And read the biography, The Little Woman. And The Little Woman, she suddenly realizes when, she, when the boat reaches the harbor in China, and she looks across, and what does she see? All these tiny little people with jet black hair. And she says, oh, here we are. Here we are. What an amazing thing it is. Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. A persecuting, murdering character. Turned upside down by the power of Jesus Christ. And it is this character who now writes to Philemon to say, Onesimus has become my son. I know he was a useless character, but I'm sending him back and I believe he will live up to his name. Let's just acknowledge this. Christianity knows nothing of hopeless cases. Christianity knows nothing of hopeless cases. And we ought not to miss that the radical change that is brought about is the same change that was brought about in Paul's life too. Notice how he, he speaks of him. It's quite amazing, isn't he? He was formerly useless. Now he's useful to you, and he's useful to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. If you leave me now, you'll take away the biggest part of me. Oh, 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 no, baby. Please don't go. Please don't go. I think that's Chicago. I can't remember. All right? If you would leave me now, you'd take the biggest part of me. That's what he's actually saying here. How can you have this kind of communion? How can you have this kind of affection? This is not, this is not you see, old school tie. This is not, oh, we both went to the same university. No, we were nowhere close to one another. I was a complete wonderful character up here, and he was another character down here. And yet, I'm going to tell you that it's costing me to send him back. I wonder, I wonder, does he realize, does he remember what happened to himself after he'd been converted? You remember that after he was converted, Luke tells us that he went so that he might be joined to the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, and understandably so. And then you read this wonderful little line, but Barnabas took him. But Barnabas took him. 
Oh, how we thank God for the Barnabases in our churches. The people, Mrs. Barnabas and Mr. Barnabas and all the Barnabas children too, who have eyes to see the least and the last and the left out, who notice the person by the radiator on their own with no one really to talk to, and yet they take him. Philemon, I'm sending him back. I want you to make sure you take him. Now, the real test, of course, uh, would be um, if he was really just like getting rid of him. Like, let's say you have a company and you've got a fellow that always shows up 20 minutes late and he hasn't sold anything in the last two months and you've decided you'll phone one of your competitors and offer this fellow to them. I have somebody for you. I think he could be very useful in your area, which is completely bogus. All you really want to do is get rid of him. No, that's not what he's saying. I would have kept him because if I kept him, then he could have served me on your behalf. In other words, he could have done for me in the prison what you would have done for me. But I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do this without your consent so that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. Of course, he's going to come. We'll see this tomorrow morning, if any of us are still here. Uh, Tomorrow morning, he's going to, you know, tweak his nose just a little bit in verse 19, but we, we don't have that up there, so you don't need to worry about it. He wants Philemon to experience the joy of being a cheerful giver. The joy that is found in doing what one ought to do, not grudgingly, but freely and happily. I want you to take him back, not because I'm ordering you, I appeal to you. I want you to take him back of your own free will so that your union with one another in that new experience may be a huge pointer to the radical difference that Jesus makes in somebody's life. Verse 15, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back, and that you might have him back forever. Calvin has a wonderful little statement on this where he says, if we are angry over offenses committed by men, our anger should be soothed when we see that things done in malice have often been made to serve a different end by the purposes of God. If we live long enough, we'll we'll realize just how wonderfully insightful that is on, on his part. I love the perhaps. I hope you like the perhaps. As a pastor, one of the joys that you have is everyone wants to come and tell you their story, ask you their question, and uh, there are perennial uh, questioners, perennial storytellers. You stay in a place long enough, you're now dealing with the granddaughter of the lady who was a perennial storyteller, and it's just running genetically right through the system. I've, I've got a young boy at the moment. He's a sweet kid. He must be 11. He comes every single Sunday. He's either got something. There can be a line of 30 people, and there he will be right in the middle of it all. And uh, some of the people that come by, they seem to know a tremendous amount about the will of God. They're able to tell me, uh, this is what is happening, and this is why it is happening, and this is where it will be happening, and so on. I say to myself, Now, how come I don't know all these things? How is this? Well, if anybody was going to lay it down as this is the will of God, presumably the Apostle Paul would do it, right? I'm telling you right now, Paul says, the reason he was parted from you was this reason. No, he doesn't say that. He says, perhaps this is why he was parted from you. Don't miss the perhapses in your life. Don't let anybody other than 
I, I guess like a, a, an angelic visitor, uh, Gabriel, I would think it would have to be, tell you anything that cannot be substantiated from the scriptures themselves. Paul does this. It occurs to me, he says, maybe it's all for the best. Perhaps when you look at things in this way, maybe that's why this whole thing has happened like this. That he went away like this, which was a bad choice and a bad decision and messed you up, Philemon. But look at this. If he hadn't gone away like that, he wouldn't be coming back like this. And if he wasn't coming back like this, there would be no opportunity for this reunion. There's good precedent for this, isn't there? Story of Esther. Mordecai speaks to Esther. He doesn't tell her, this is the deal. No, he says, and who knows? And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this? Oh, well, God knows, but we don't know. So don't miss the opportunity to live with the perhaps. Live with the who knows. So that when things unfold and we discover, as we do in the living of our lives, that suddenly we can see things far better through the rearview mirror than we can see them through the windscreen that we suddenly look back and we wonder at it all. We won't do the story of Joseph. You've got that, haven't you? Why did these people, his brothers, hate him? Were they pawns in the will of God? They were pre-programmed to hate him? No, they hated him. They were jealous of him. They flat out didn't like him. Why did those traders buy him? Were they pre-programmed to buy him? No, that's what they did. You bought people. He was a good-looking fellow. They could make a buck. Let's buy him. Sell him here. And so it goes. Till in that great denouement, and his, and his brother suddenly realized who he is. He says, ego, emi, it is me. I'm your brother. And they're immediately overwhelmed by it, aren't they? And he says, hey, guys, hang on. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good in the mystery of his purposes so that when the famine came, there would be resources to be provided. Was it a happy journey through there? Was it a fun time spent in the jail? Was it a difficulty when he was seduced, tempted, seduced? by the guy, his boss, his wife. No, it was horrendous stuff. But through it all, we sang about it this morning, didn't we? When darkness seems to hide his face, the loss of a loved one, a child that has turned left instead of right, perhaps. You see, from a human perspective, We'd probably say, from a human perspective, that if Onesimus was ever going to become a believer in Jesus, the best possible place for that to happen was in the home of Philemon, because Philemon had become a Christian. Now, he's, now Onesimus is working for a Christian boss. Now, that would be a perfect place for him to become a Christian. He, he runs away, runs away from his master, little knowing that he runs right into the pathway of the master. So God, by his hidden providence, wonderfully, mysteriously, directs the path, the ruinous path, essentially, of Onesimus, so as to bring him into contact with Paul. How did he get there? Well, he ran, he ran away. Was he programmed to run away? No, he ran away. And again, here's the thing. I don't know how Philemon came to trust in Christ, and I don't know what happened here with Onesimus. What was he doing? Was he working in the prison? Was he serving meals? Was he sweeping, as we heard about this evening? And in that context, did he see the difference in Paul? Did he look at this guy and say, what is it that makes this guy 
Because after all, you know, Paul, along with his buddy, they had been singing some good songs in the night, you know, in the Philippian context, who knows, but he was singing again. And, and Onesimus says, you know, why do you sing? And he says, well, I can tell you. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus? Yeah, he says, I used to hate Jesus. I hated the followers of Jesus. In fact, I met Jesus when I was actually trying to destroy his followers. And Onesimus says, oh, gee, you got to tell me this story. This is fantastic. And somewhere in that great discourse, however it happened, Onesimus bows his knees to Christ. Newton's friend, Newton's friend, you call him one thing, I call him something. Who is Newton's friend? I'm going to quote to you, God moves in a mysterious way. Who's Newton's friend who wrote the hymn? Come on. Cowper, that's it, that's it, thank you. Who, who came up with that? <laughs> Give that man an ice cream cone. That is fantastic. Yeah, Americans call him Cooper, and we call him Cowper. I say I don't call him anything because I can't remember his name. But anyway, <laughs> it was it was it was William Cowper who wrote that hymn, and it has the lines: "Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face." Perhaps that's why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, and no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. It really would be a dreadful thing if Philemon were not to take him back. And it would be a dreadful sign of haughtiness if in our congregations we should find ourselves unprepared to count as our brothers and sisters those whom God has made his sons and daughters. Wow. It's quite amazing, isn't it? I find it amazing. I think about it in so many ways. I don't know all your lives. I don't know your background. I, don't, I know one or two of you, but in, in many ways only superficially. But when we look back over our lives, we'll realize these things. Uh, when uh, Fernando sings, uh, When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I am lost in wonder, love and praise, unnumbered comforts to my soul. Thy tender care bestowed before my infant heart conceived from whom those comforts flowed. When in the foolish paths of youth with heedless steps I ran. I imagine Onesimus singing this. When in the foolish paths of youth with heedless steps I ran, thine hand conveyed me safely up and brought me up to man. Perhaps God has something for us in the perhapses of our lives if we just keep our eyes in the right direction. Father, thank you for all that this night so far has meant to us, all the stirring of the words, the pictures, the songs. Thank you for the amazing reality that all these moments that pass by on a daily basis uh, under your gracious providential care have plan and purpose to them. That we look forward to a day when from every nation and tribe and language and tongue there will be such a gathering around your throne and declaring that you are God. So seal your word to us this day, we pray. Write in our hearts that which is of yourself. Help us to forget anything that is unhelpful or harmful in any way. 
And may we rest in the arms of your affection. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.